welcome. My name is Freed, and you are listening to Where's the Popcorn? This is a segment where I take IMDb's 100 Greatest Films list, and I put 1 through 100 in a random number generator, hit enter, and watch the movie that corresponds to whatever number has been given. This is the third installment of this series, and we previously have checked out Fargo and Wuthering Heights. And if you're a fan of those, by all means, check those episodes out after this one. Now today, the random number generator has landed on my lucky number, number nine. And of course, I'm going to give you a quote before we begin to see if you can guess what flick we're talking about. All right, listen closely, because here it comes. Do you think there's anything wrong with your mind, really? Not a thing, Doc. I'm a goddamn marvel of modern science. Now, even with that piss-poor impersonation, I'm sure you can figure out which movie we're talking about. We're talking about the 1975 ultra-classic, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. Coming in at number nine on IMDb's definitive greatest films of all time list. Based off of Ken Kesey's 1962 novel with the same name, who strongly disapproved of this flick upon learning of the changes being made to the movie. Uh, More specifically, he didn't like that they took out his favorite character from being the narrator. Directed by Milos Forman, who won the Oscar for Best Director that year, the film stars Jack Nicholson as Randall Patrick McMurphy, a.k.a. R.P., Louise Fletcher as Nurse Mildred Ratchet. You'll even see Danny DeVito and Christopher Lloyd in there. And this was actually Christopher Lloyd's debut film. Now, another actor making his film debut was the stuttering, love-struck suicide survivor Billy, played by Brad Doris. It's very understandable that you don't recognize his name, but I guarantee you recognize some of his characters. He plays Wormtongue from two of the Lord of the Rings movies, and he also plays Doc Cochran in the Deadwood series. And the cherry on top is that he's from Huntington, West Virginia. Go herd. Yeah, us West Virginians take a lot of pride when one of us hits it big. All right, well, the first time this was actually turned into a performance was a stage performance starring Kirk Douglas. And he was so set on making this book a film that he contacted director Foreman. He mailed him the book. Uh, when the foreman was living in Czechoslovakia and the customs officer confiscated the book. And that led to foreman thinking that Douglas was a liar because Douglas said he was going to send him the book. And then that led to Douglas thinking that foreman was an asshole for not responding. And believe it or not, Jack Nicholson wasn't Douglas's and foreman's first choice. Uh, They considered Gene Hackman, Marlon Brando, and even Burt Reynolds, which was actually the director's favorite, mine too, before eventually landing on good old Jack. It was the second film ever to win all five major Academy Awards. The first was It Happened One Night, 41 years prior. Those awards include Best Picture, Best Actor in a Leading Role, Best Actress in a Leading Role, Best Director, and Best Screenplay. All right, this film was actually shot in Oregon at a mental institution, the Oregon State Hospital, which was actually the setting for the novel as well. And although the hospital is still operating, the buildings in which the film have been filmed have since been demolished, unfortunately. They even use some of the real patients as extras. How crazy is that? One day, a crew member left the second story window open and a patient managed to squeeze himself out, falling to the ground and injuring himself. All right, now, just like before, there may be some things mentioned that some would consider spoilers. So take that into consideration before continuing. I I personally don't think anything here will take away from your viewing experience, but hey, that's just me. All right, action. Our film takes place in 1963, and we first see R.P. McMurphy, played by Jack Nicholson, in case you forgot, being led into the hospital wearing restraints, giving us the impression that he is potentially violent or at the very least unpredictable, and upon being released from said restraints, we get our first taste of the lunacy residing in R.P., well, at least the lunacy he wants people to believe he is capable of. Fun fact, it's called lunacy because people once believed a person's wild behavior was brought about by the cycles of the moon, hence the luna part of lunacy. Anyways, after seeing this introduction, I visualize the other actors considered for the role, and in no way would Burt Reynolds be able to pull that off. And I love me some bandit, don't get me wrong. Gene Hackman? Maybe. Marlon Brando? Definitely. But then you'd have to hire someone to hold up his lines off camera. Anywho, while getting his initial consultation, we get the foundation laid for R.P. McMurphy. Is he faking it, or does he genuinely have a few screws loose in the old noggin? We'll get back to that towards the end. This scene shows that R.P. does have a history of violence, and he justifies it by comparing himself to pro boxer Rocky Marciano, because I guess in his mind, fighting is just fighting. It's explained that R.P. is there just under observation. And after that, he's put in, I guess you can call it the gen pop of the psych ward, where we meet his fellow patients. 
The director does a great job giving each of the patients, quote unquote, enough screen time and backstory to elicit some empathy from the viewer and each of those supporting actors absolutely nail it. And I heard the actors even lived in that hospital for the entire time of shooting. And one of them was even put under observation because he was showing signs of legitimately losing touch with reality. Now in the hospital, RP finds the biggest guy, in this case, a large Native American named Chief. And having come from prison, this makes sense that he takes action. Uh, thankfully, in this case, it was in the way of befriending him as opposed to establishing dominance through violence. It was actually quite easy for RP to win over his fellow mental patients. And he realized the biggest challenge would be winning over Nurse Ratchet, or at least, you know, manipulating her to get what he wanted, which was the primary objective in the very beginning. Over time, RP develops some sympathy for his new friends and comes up with a plan that could, A, reestablish his lack of sanity, or at least the image of that, and B, getting his new friends a taste of the world outside the hospital. He stages an exodus by hijacking the wreck bus and absconding to a local fishing port where they commandeer a boat. And I absolutely love the beginning of the sequence, too. RP tells the harbor master that they are all doctors, except for the one with the highest intelligence, and he keeps him down there as a mister. <laughs> That's great. Fishing ensues, and when they return to the harbor, the authorities are waiting, along with some bystanders, and in a uh, blink-and-you'll-miss-it moment, you see Jack Nicholson's then-girlfriend, Angelica Houston, as one of those bystanders. Upon returning to the hospital, RP continues to push the envelope to the point of violence. A fight starts that leads to RP and two other patients being ordered to undergo shock therapy. Is it effective? Well, I'm not telling, because that's all I'm giving you. Hit play and see for yourself. As for my thoughts and opinions surrounding this flick, I do realize that this episode was more of a superficial character analysis of Randall Patrick McMurphy than a full-on movie synopsis, and there are tons of things we could cover within this film that would take hours, frankly. Hell, I barely touched on Nurse Ratchet. I mean, she had to have given the green light for that shock therapy, right? In the end, I gave this movie a solid 8.3 out of 10. It's fantastic and well-deserved of all the accolades. I haven't read the book, but I do plan to. I just want to see what Ken Kesey was so bummed about. The character RP was dynamic, like predictably unpredictable, and left us wondering if he actually was on the wrong side of mental stability. I mean, he really would walk on the edge, wouldn't he? The thing is, his actions done anywhere else would be chalked up as just insubordinate or maybe quote-unquote menace to society, but in this setting, it puts a coat of mild insanity onto it all, which puts our perspectives into question. It's fantastic. I'm not surprised at all to see this on IMDb's top 10, and I'm totally comfortable with it being there. Now, if I was making a top 10 list, I'm not sure I'd include this one, but hell, these things are subjective. All right, well, that's my time. Thank you so much for listening, and please join me next time when we watch a random flick from this list. And until then, save me a seat.